Welcome back everyone. This is the next video in the discrete amplifier build project. Hopefully you saw the last video where I took a look at the complementary feedback pair output stage. Built up a circuit and did a bunch of tests. So now I'm going to take that circuit and convert it to this, which is known as an emitter follower output stage using this Darlington configuration. This really performs as an emitter follower stage, but they don't normally call it that. So I tore down that amplifier output stage from the last video and getting ready to build it up. So if you compare these, you can see the differences with the Darlington configuration and the CFP configuration. These discharge resistors, or speed up resistors, whatever you want to call them, you notice it's just one resistor here. A lot of times you will see two resistors with the output connected in the middle. But a lot of designers do it this way because, well, you save one part. Plus it might perform slightly better. So why not? But, you know, besides the way these transistors are connected, everything else is the same. There will be a little bit different bias spreader voltage here. You know, in the CFP side, we had two diode junctions, so we needed about 1.2, 1.3 volts in this bias spreader section. But now we have two diode junctions, so it'll be 2.4 to 2.6 volts or so. All right, so without further ado, I'll build the circuit up and we will get testing this. And by the way, this output network here, which I didn't show in the last video, but that's what I use to stabilize this CFP output stage. One thing I want to briefly cover before moving on is how did I figure the current to run in this stage of the amplifier? Well, it depends on how much current you need from the output and the gain of the driver and output transistors. For example, if I'm running with a supply of plus and minus 35 volts, I need to figure what the peak current I'm going to need from this output is. So when the waveform swings up to the top or the bottom maximum point, uh, what would the current be? Well, with 35 volt supply, 4 ohm loads, I want the amp to be 4 ohm capable. Uh, it'll be probably maximum figuring in the losses. It'll probably peak up to uh, maximum plus or minus 30 volts. So we can take 30 uh, divided by 4 ohms. 7.5 amps. Now in the real world, the amplifier is probably going to have to deal with reactive loads. So you want to pad that number out somewhat. Maybe, say, 12 amps. I'm going to say 10 because it's easy to figure in my head. And at such high current, the power resistor is going to suffer what's called beta droop, which means the gain is going to be a lot less than it is at smaller currents, say 1 amp. These transistors might have a gain of 100 at lower currents, but at higher currents, like 10 amps, they will certainly droop. You know, some transistors will droop down to a gain of 10 or less at higher currents. These transistors are pretty good. They don't droop very low. I'd have to look at the data sheet, but I think the, uh, the higher grade ones, the higher gain rated ones, only droop to about a gain of 50. These are pretty good audio transistors. That's why I'm using them. Uh, I also have to look at the gain of the driver. Keeping in mind that this speed up or uh, discharge resistor, whatever you want to call it, does steal some of the current that would normally flow into the base of the output. So you have to consider that when calculating the gain. So you know, under a high current condition, we'll figure we have a gain of a thousand. So using a, a current of 10 amps and a gain of 1000 to make it easier to calculate, you come out with 10 milliamps. So I chose these resistors with the uh, voltage that I'm using, plus and minus 10 volts. There's about 10 milliamps. Now, the biasing network here does take away some of the, the voltage drops, so we're only running about 9 milliamps. 
However, since I'm only running this circuit at plus and minus 10 volts, I'm never going to put any more than about 2 amps into the output. So this is way more than necessary. But it does help me uh, set up this biasing because in the actual circuit, it will be running around 10 milliamps or so. So I want to have the resistances and everything with this biasing circuit set up. And here is the circuit set up. Looks pretty much the same as it does with the CFP stage. You know, just flipping those transistors around, I pretty much had to tear it down and start again because the positions of everything shifted. But hey, when I hooked it up and turned it on, it worked right off the bat. I didn't have any screw-ups. And it's been sitting here idling. You know, we're at plus minus 10 volts. And when I turned it on, it was drawing 40 milliamps which means the output's biased at 30 because about 10 is going into the you know front end of the circuit another thing I should mention is um, you can run additional current in this part of the circuit you know a lot more than you'd need the, the output's only going to take what it needs it's just that you don't want to go too high because that can mean more distortion you know when you're running excessive current. The devices that have to deal with that current have to dissipate more heat and you can have higher distortion. But in my case I want to keep this circuit as similar as possible that I did with the CFP stage for comparison. So I'll run with that. Okay let's fire up the scope and test it out. Okay putting in a 1 kilohertz sine wave. I crank it up you can see we're clipping. Now that's not the amplifier clipping, that is the preamp clipping. Keep in mind that these emitter follower stages have no voltage gain. So whatever voltage you put in, you're going to get slightly less out. So I can kind of throw sort of a, a hard edge, like a square wave edge. Yeah, it's not true square wave of course, but you can see how that affects the amplifier. And the nice thing is, no oscillation at all. I think the CFP, we were getting some oscillation when I, you know, hit it with this sharp edge here on the negative rail. So it's already looking more stable. Next, I'm going to put a capacitor across the output. We'll start with this one nanofarad. Just plug it in across the output. Just like before, we're getting the beard on the bottom, the bottom side fuzzy. So I will keep trying other capacitors. Next is a, uh, a 103 uh, 10 nanofarad. Just plug that in across the output. And we're getting some crazy, let's see, yeah, that's just aliasing on the oscilloscope. You don't see it here. But we are getting um, topside oscillation now. Let's see what happens with, if I go higher still. Uh, next is a 104, a 100 nanofarad. That is interesting. It's not oscillating anymore. I really should be checking doing this as well, making it handle the hard edge. Uh, it's uh, stable now. Okay, well let's go even higher. I'll try a 274. That is a 270 nanofarad. Nothing stable. So it seems to be less stable with the lower value capacitors. Okay, I'll give it a one microfarad. See how it deals with that. Well, it, we killed it. I just uh, disconnected the scope. Okay, we're back again. And, well, still no oscillations. So that's interesting. If you remember with the CFP, when I went higher and higher with the capacitance, it just got more unstable. But with this, the lower value capacitance 
it was oscillating, but as I increased in value, it became stable. So that's pretty interesting. So now I'm going to put on the Bouchero cell on the output, which consists of a 10 ohm resistor in series with a 0.22 nanofarad capacitor. Okay, I'll start with the 1 nanofarad capacitor. Plug that guy in. And now, no oscillation. Let's move up to the 10 nanofarad. Looking good. Keep in mind, just like in the previous video, I do have a 4 ohm load across the amplifier. It's important to do this test with the amplifier loaded because you want the uh, output stage conducting a lot of current when you do this. Okay, this is the 100 nano and it's still stable. Next is the 270 nano. Normally an amplifier would never see a direct capacitance of such levels on its output. Now this thing is still rocking it stable. Okay, we'll go for broke with the one microfarad capacitor. Of course, before it was still stable with this, but no difference, still stable. Okay, well, with the emitter follower, I didn't have to resort to using the coil to make it stable. Let's take a look at the distortion now. Okay, here is the distortion. This is the 1% pilot signal. So we are seeing about a 0.9% second harmonic, uh, maybe half a percent of a third and a notch of a fourth, and the rest is pretty clean. So in this case, the CFP was doing better. If you remember, it had only a third of a second harmonic and a smaller blip of this, as I recall. It did have some more blips out here, which I'm not seeing. Well, I guess this is kind of not surprising because it's pretty much textbook. You know, the complementary feedback pair is supposed to be more linear, which it was. It had less distortion, but it is tends to be less stable. However, the emitter follower Darlington configuration is less linear. We are seeing more distortion, but it's more stable. Almost forgot. I got to put music through it, or people would never forgive me. That was from a Canadian group called The Pulpers. The album was The Magic People from 1967. Skip Prokop, who is no longer with us, went on to start the band Lighthouse. A lot of Canadians should know that group. I visit a friend up in Michigan every so often, and he turns me on to this type of music. Now, it's from a period of music that I like a lot. There's a lot of good stuff out there that's just not discovered, at least by me yet. And apparently a lot of other people, a lot of this stuff didn't make it on the pop charts or the album charts, but it was still very good music. Another thing I will demonstrate for you is how nasty crossover distortion sounds and why it should be eliminated at all costs. It splatters harmonics all over the spectrum and just, it sounds like crap. So I have this YouTube safe music that I can play here and I'll start it out and then I'll turn down the bias so that the output transistors are not conducting for the full cycle of the waveform. Here we go! Okay, I'll turn the bias down now. Yeah, that's pretty nasty. I heard the intermodulation effects. I heard the crackling of the, the sound. It was awful. So yeah, that's why we bias up our output stages and eliminate that as much as we can. 
you can see here the only those resistors at the front of the output stage are conducting. The outputs are not conducting at all. Well, that's pretty much it, but I do want to leave you with a few thoughts before I close. Now, as far as thermal stability and biasing, I did set all that up. I didn't shoot it in this segment of the video. It's pretty much the same as the last. I will say that thermal tracking is very good. When I fired this thing up cold, the output was about 30 milliamps, and it still is. It says 40 because you have to remember that some current is flowing about 9 milliamps is flowing in this front end of this output stage so you have to subtract that off the total so uh, anyway thermal stability is pretty good when I hooked this up I made sure this biasing transistor was touching the heatsink obviously it's not bolted on with thermal grease or anything but pretty happy with that I did change the resistor value here and made this adjustment a little less touchy. 3.3K and a 2K potentiometer. So is this the be-all end-all test of emitter follower versus complementary feedback pair? No, not by a long shot. There's a lot more tests that can be done. It might be better to test this at higher currents where you can run into more of an issue but I really can't do that on the socket boards. I need a uh, actual solder up a circuit, which, you know, it's more time consuming to do all that thing. I just wanted to test these two types of output stage topologies under the same condition. So, you know, this is what I used. It certainly can get a lot more deeper into um, how these two output stages compare to one another. So what am I going to use? Well, pretty much from the very beginning, I was leaning towards emitter follower. Now, for a first amplifier build, uh, I don't want to run into a situation where I, you know, if it does become a kit, I don't want to put a kit out there and end up having problems with, you know, somebody hooks up some sort of weird load to it and the thing turns into an oscillator. I'm going to be conservative and go with the emitter follower type stage. Is it going to have 1% distortion like we saw on the scope? Absolutely not. You have to remember there is no global feedback applied yet. The complete amplifier will have a huge abundance of open loop gain versus closed loop gain and it uses all that surplus gain in correcting those distortions. I don't want to release an amplifier that has a lot of distortion. It's got to be under 0 0.01. I'd like to shoot for 0 0.001. Uh, like I said in the beginning, I don't want to make a complex amplifier. I want to keep the parts down. It'll certainly be more complex than some amplifiers that are out there, but it's not going to be one of these amplifiers that have 20 some transistors in it. I'm kind of shooting for the middle of the road. No way I could believe that anybody would be able to hear distortions down at 0 .001. Even at 0.1%, I just don't believe anybody can discern distortion in music. In fact, some tests showed that people couldn't detect distortion above 1%, so, you know, around 1 or 2%. But certainly, I don't want to make an amplifier with that much distortion. Okay, I'm not sure what else I can say. I rambled on enough. I hope you enjoyed this little segment of the discrete audio amplifier build project. And I thank you kindly for watching.